Hello, and welcome to Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and you're listening to episode 90 with Chris Kempinski, DP of the CW series Kung Fu. Enjoy. Yeah, because that was actually going to be one of my questions was just about um, coming through, like, because a lot of times you'll either get DPs who, like, just jumped at DP, DPs who started in lighting, um, or DPs who are architects. I don't know why. There's a lot of architects. <laughs> well, you're you're assembling, you know, you're, especially when it comes to blocking or, like, you know, a three-dimensional world, like, you really need to be able to um, utilize a camera in that kind of frame, framing, a framework. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's like... It, it would make sense. Architect would actually be interesting. Like I, I came, I came in from cooking, which is like, oh, that, so, that explains the hat. <laughs> right. And as a sous chef, like it's just like you, you, you learn to take in a bunch of information, prioritize it in a pattern and then, um, and then, and then learn how to, you know, um, piece it back together again and in priority order, which, which is exactly the same, exactly the same mindset that you need on a film set. Like you yeah. need to take in a whole bunch of information, discard the things that aren't important or that are not related to you. Understand that, you know, this has to happen before this, before this, before that, before this. And then when it all comes together, you, you hand it to the server and two takes it to the table. Right. Which is interesting. Yeah. And under pressure as well. I think oh. that's probably the, <laughs> the bigger well, help. Funny. Almost. I always laugh because people are like, oh, people, people in the film industry could be so you know, angry and mean sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, but at least they don't have like 12 inch knives and piping hot plates being thrown at you. You know what I mean? Like, it's like a totally different. And they're not on Coke. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And it's, just, it's, it's mostly just their words. It's not, you know, which is, I mean, anyways, it's times have changed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, uh, I was, I was, you know, doing some research as you do. And, uh, I stumbled upon <clears throat> some posts of yours on the cinematography forums from like back in the day. Yeah. Uh, and I love when I find that cause there's only been a couple DPs, like one of them, I remember it was like Larkin Seipel, you know, everything everywhere. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was him. I found some like, you know, posts from forum posts from back in the day. And I was like, that we all like in the 07 to like 2010 area, we all were just on forums chatting with like David Mullen and stuff. Well, to talking about David Mullen, man, like he was so open with information. Like I, yeah. I was just a kid that was excited. I was shooting weekend stuff on 16 millimeter and he would answer questions on that forum for me. That was just like, to me, that was life changing. And it really set an example as to the, you don't have to hold all your cards tight to you, you know, like it, if someone can do the job better than I can, I mean, you're going to inspire me to want to do better work. You know, you're not a threat to me in my, in my opinion yeah. it, is you're, you're more, you're more of a, you know, a colleague that's, you know, that's pushing me to do better. And I, and I, and I, I, I learned that from David Mullen. I mean, he's just like, he, and again, even on those forums in the early two thousands, he was like just an open book, which was really cool. Really just, just, and, and just a wealth of information. Yeah. It is kind of frustrating. Cause I still, I'm sorry. I still love, um, you know, learning, obviously we all do, but it does feel like the, the avenues to learning are now more kind of just stuck in books. Like that, that, um, I don't want you active education space, like the early 2000s forums don't tend to exist anymore. Now it's a lot of like YouTubers and stuff, which can be educational depending on what you're talking about. But, um, yeah. that, that, think, that sharing of knowledge doesn't seem to exist anymore. I think the chips and the lenses have gotten so good now that yeah. it used to be like to get your hands on a film camera and actually find someone to pay to put film through the process. I mean, that was a struggle on its own let alone knowing how to expose it and, and tell a story. But the, I think the, um, it, it's not, it's no longer the want. It's, it's all about the magician now. I mean, you can yeah, take, yeah, yeah. you can take any sensor these days and if you know how to expose it properly and, and stay within its limits, I mean, you can, you can get a nice picture. You know what? I actually just, uh, cause I, I write the website that distributes this podcast pro video coalition. I write, reviews for them and, and just other articles and stuff. But, um, oh, I don't think this was an article. I think it's just YouTube. But anyway, I found my old AF 100 oh, and, yeah. uh, 
and like was like, I wonder if I could make this look and come to find out the AF100 still looks pretty good. It's a little crispy in the highs for sure, but uh, still not uh, bad. And then even going back, I the same, did the same thing with the XL2. XL2, obviously it's, you know, sensors, I mean, the, the resolution's about 16 by 10, but Honestly, but I mean, like again, I'm I'm re- I'm looking. I haven't redone. I haven't had to cut a demo reel in in eight years. I I have had the same demo reel, and it's fine. Um, but I'm starting to assemble all the pieces to make a better demo reel. And oh, really? My red one footage, the original, the original red one was <laughs> stuff looked great, man. Like I was just like, because I I did most of my early like bigger DP stuff um, was web series that. We right. shot on the red one. It was, that was the, you know, for 20 grand, you could get in and buy yourself a 4K camera. And, and that was, that was pretty bleeding edge at the time. Just pretty crazy. Yeah. That, you know, that, uh, I'm only a little younger than you, but I, back, that was when I was in college around that time. And the like web series era of filmmaking, I, that's that's how me and all my friends thought we were going to get into the industry right like oh we're going to nail so we were all doing it and so to see like way better projects come out like yours uh was it was a reese or right reese it's it called reese yeah that's right yeah uh i can read um uh, <laughs> but it's a uh, weird spelling yeah um yeah like you were saying it, it was like encouraging it wasn't like oh no we're never gonna reach that it was always like that's possible you know yeah. except we have like a 7D or an AF100 DVX. Most of us were under the DVX. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, like this is, this goes back to this whole, like, I mean, I was a lamp op and then on weekends I'd shoot stuff like that. And, and right. I, I was lucky that I met producers and even those producers now are still open doors for me from, from, from those days they, because they've gone on to bigger, different things. And, um, like Reese was, Reese was a, it, it was a no budget show. I mean, we had the camera. Well, I wouldn't say no budget. It was, it was a small. It looked budget. really good. Thank you. No, anyway, and, and again, like that's where I was, I was working in commercials and I was working with like top DPs, but I'd have long stretches of, you know, no work, which was great. Mm-hmm. And it let me do that kind of stuff. But as you know, I mean, you go into every project with the highest of hopes. And normally before sandwiches come out on day one, you know, whether or not you made a horrendous mistake or, 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 or you've been gifted an amazing opportunity. Right? right. And I think Reese was one of those like amazing opportunities for sure. Yeah. Cause what was the, there was only a couple of like, uh, Dr. Horrible sing-along blog, I think was around that time and the well, writer's strike. And, and Sanctuary, Sanctuary was like the first one that like, you know, made it to network television. So Sanctuary right. started as a web series. And then Reese, I really thought Reese was going to get picked up. They did pitch it, but um, the, it was on the Sci-Fi homepage for a long time. And, oh, the, and then, the TV station, Sci-Fi. Yeah, the Sci-Fi TV yeah. station. So it was it was on their homepage as a web series. They didn't. They never uh, aired it as a TV show. And then oh, that missed its mark by like eight years, six years, because that would have hit. Uh, no one, no one was going to that website in 2007. I know. And that's what just like, so anyways, it's, and, but that's the industry, right? It's just like, yeah. you're so close and you're just like, you're about to hit that, like that light line drive. But, um, yeah. Well, it, it is, it is good to, cause it's, uh, it's interesting. You, you said you're working on your demo reel. Cause I'd, I'd like, <laughs> I going to say, I'd like to know why I know why, but like, uh, a lot of DPs that I've talked to have said like producers don't, or clients, whoever don't really look at your real that's instagram reels your work your cv reel yes. um do you find that do you not find that to be the case then i do and then, i mean again that's why i've gone eight years without having to do one but i just looked at i've been watching in my my the one from 2015 is music videos and commercials mostly uh right really good artsy stuff but it's not like i've done great really good episodic and and i've been very happy with what you know, the pictures that I've been able to, you know, pull out from, um, from some of the newer shows. And, and I'd love to be able to put together more of a drama reel. I think, I think some producers that don't know you will, uh, will want to see you cut together like a full, they'll want to see something cut together of a, like a first right. piece or action sequence that, that you've done 
that that uh, that way they know that you're capable of ju- of more than just like you know those one one or two pretty shots kind of thing, and then you're, you're able to assemble a you know a cohesive scene if that makes sense. Sure. Um, oh, as you've heard this podcast, I tend to jump around. Um, the thing I remembered was because uh, we'll get back to the the reels and stuff, but I did want to ask you know especially working on a lot of television um in your career especially in in, uh the lighting department and second unit and stuff i was wondering if there's anything that you've learned that has made you more efficient on these larger you know like marvel shows or stuff like kung fu or whatever um because i think you know especially when you're on something a bigger budget or if you're (laughs) if you're um maybe a more more uh came up on like the artsy side of things and not not so much the technical uh you can overcomplicate your setups or something i've watched dps light themselves in circles right where they they start they they start doing this and then all of a sudden by the time they get back here they're they're it's all flat so then they start over again and they just keep going in circles and trying to find contrast so i think um i've learned a lot i've learned a lot just sitting and watching you know both my idols as a as a again in commercial um, in layup op and um even big, on big features and stuff um I've, util- I've learned to utilize my rigging department like extremely and, and my art department in terms of like setting the tone of of what i need and, and setting my backlights like right away so they're already there and i don't have to i just have to lift the lid off of that or or you know with a drop drop whatever may already be rigged up there and then turn on the i think i'll ring of backlights and then come in with a key light and finesse the actor's faces and stuff. Um, so yeah. I, I really learned to utilize um, the pre the, the prep crew, which you don't always get, um, but on bigger shows you, you do. And I really, but it, you know, on, on Hellstrom, um, I started doing with, with giant second units, like they were big chase scenes, big, you know, um, I, they were just establishers, some of them, but there was lightning and wind and rain towers, just all this kind of stuff going on. And it was just a giant building where that had to light it and light the inside of it. But the, um, you kind of prioritize like, okay, today, this is all about camera movement. I have to nail this, you know, this one or that we're going to go down the stairs. We're going to lick, we're going to hit to this gimbal, drop down four flights of stairs. They're going to pick it up and carry it on to the thing. So you, you kind of, you prioritize what the the importances are. Again, it's kind of what we were talking about with cooking. sous chef thing. Yeah, totally. So you have to sit there and go, okay, well, how much can I finesse my lighting? Can I? Is this location a place that I can naturally light from outside the window so that I don't have to on the day when we get here, I don't have to focus on lighting as much as I do nailing this camera movement, right? So there's there's just I I don't know if I'm getting off topic too much, but no. like from a technical technical side it's funny because like af- after reese i wanted to just be a dp and right. reese was what 2010 but, uh that's what it seemed like yeah <laughs> 2009 is i guess when you were posting about it yeah so i think i think i i went to 2015 before i really joined the the, the uh, iot like uh icg as a full dp mm-hmm. so i went another six years before I actually just focused on camera and being a DP, um, which to me is, seems like such a long time, but I wouldn't change it for the world because the amount of things that like what I learned in those six years is, is what is the toolbox that I have now. And then as soon as you step up into that top brass position, it's not that you stop learning, but you get like, I, for me, it's like, I, I, I lost the ability to just be, you know, like a, 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 a pigeon on a, you know, and an unsuspecting, you know, um, eye watching everything. Right. Uh, and I stopped taking all that in. So, and now I know what I know, like what I know is what I know and I have to utilize that. So my tool, my, my toolbox, I think the point is my toolbox filled up the longer I was sure. a technique and able to work with DPs under different circumstances, different projects and whatever. It let me, it, it just gave me the technical decide to be able to be confident now because now i don't even worry about i barely worry about the camera or the lighting like hmm. i i do during prep but i'm you know by the time you especially for tv you get into 
post prep shoot, you know, reading new scripts, you really don't have time. Plus the politics side of everything, you really right. don't have a lot of time to worry about set, <laughs> which is, I don't know if anybody's really talked about that, but. No, that's actually a good point. Cause like indie stuff, someone asked me, I was at the Kodak awards two nights ago oh, nice. and, uh, it was fun. And I was talking to a guy who didn't work in the industry at all. And he was asking what a DP does. And I was like, well, <laughs> on a small set, I'm doing everything. And on a big set, I'm doing nothing. <laughs> 100% true. You're just sitting on a monitor and telling people you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, talking, talking to the director more than anyone else. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, again, like, you know, commercials, you're talking to the client and they, and, you know, trying to set, you know, make sure that you're getting their vision and, and, um, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a weird job and it's hard to explain to people that don't know what, what we do. At, at parties, I just started saying plumber. <laughs> no one asks more questions. Really? I'm like, yeah, dad was a plumber. And they're like, cool. Do you like that? I'm like, that's yeah, fun. What about you? And then just move on because. Yeah. You shot anything I've seen? No. <laughs> you met, you met any famous people? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So they, for, I think that's cool that you went to the Kodak award. They, I, I, I just, I have a 30, Aerie 35.3 and I just, nice. shot, just shot a music video on like this, like, 15 year old like uh recans that it's been sitting in my closet for not even in a fridge like sitting in my closet for like 15 years and really uh, the guy that i did dead shack with like a uh, um peter reek he uh he's also a musician and a graphic novelist like the guy's a he's a pretty cool dude really he's got he's he's got a lot going on but um i'm like dude i have the camera i have the i have the film like, let's just do this. Let's just shoot something and just let's see how it happens. So we, we shot it on, you know, expired 15 year old, you know, uh, three perf anamorphic or four perf anamorphic. And it looked fantastic. Oh, hell yeah. So what was it still 5219 or? Yeah. A lot of 5219, a lot of, it's a little, uh, 5272, which is weird. And then, okay, uh, yeah, I know there was a bunch of stuff. Like most of it was 5219. I did, I ended up buying some new 500 tungsten just because we had some night stuff to shoot. Um, yeah. and some off-speed stuff, but, um, but 90% of it, like it, the rule of thumb was like one, st and again, I think that was a David Mullen thing. Like I could be wrong, but it was like one stop of, you had to overexpose one stop for every 10 years. It was it expired. That is a hundred percent of David Mullen thing. Yeah. So, so I, I had to over, I overexposed a stop and a half, you know, for most of it. And then I, but I also overexposed my negative by a stop normally. So I was expo we're exposing by two and a half stops, which is it's <laughs> awesome. So much you're fun. sitting there going like, oh shit, it's this again. Forgot yeah. about this part. The yeah. Well, but it's you know what? I, the good thing is I still light with a light meter, and I do that for digital. Same. Um, only because for continuity, so that when I when we turn around, I know that I need a four and a third of that key light. And the cool thing with with LEDs is it's it's a it's a linear curve, so you're not you're not dealing with those old sine wave curves like when you dim the light or throw a scrim in it, it might not be exact like it's it's exact like if you say give me 50 percent, you're you're losing a stop right which is which is great so you can you can dial your lights in exactly i mean and you can do that with a waveform monitor as well um but yes this is nice and, and when i'm and when i'm shooting film i usually sit on the dolly with a light with a the spot meter and i'm right. like i'm spot metering everything so that i know where my values are that way, which is great. Like I, again, I'm, I'm glad I've, I kept that up. I didn't let that go. I legitimately wish I could just spend more time in the spot meter. <laughs> I, I think also is like, the, it's like the Roger Deakins, like when you don't know what to do, you just put your eye in the eyepiece and just think for a minute. Yeah. So people think you're doing something, but it's like <laughs> the spot meter, when I finally got a spot meter, I had a regular light meter from shooting film. I got in like 06, something like that. And I, I just bought one with a spot meter in it like three years ago, two years ago. And it's the best. You just like face, face. Yep. That's good. Just make it that though. Every time like, and the color meter. Yeah. <laughs> the new one's crazy. I, I still have the old one from when I was a gaffer, a commercial gaffer. And, um, I don't, I don't even know. I don't think that it's calibrated anymore, but, um, and I don't, I wouldn't know who would even be able to calibrate it. They could, you'd have to get inside and find small people to kind of like turn the knobs and stuff. But, right. uh, I, the new one is amazing. Yeah. That's, that's the one I have the C 800. 
it's crazy. Like in the, what it, what it sees and what it doesn't, it's, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool tool. I, uh, made an entire website that I have yet to launch. And by I, I mean, I hired someone, uh, but I went and I metered every light I could find at film tools, um, and elsewhere, you know, the rental house by my house lights that I own. Um, and I'm just going to put out, obviously it's not like a robust scientific study, but just put out like what these lights are putting out. Cause like the thing that's so frustrating is on a smaller set, you know, if I'm the AC or whatever, um, you, they'll be like, all right, just set it to 5,600, set that to 5,600 by, and, and I'm like, you don't know, you don't know. Like mm -hmm. I have a light that, you know, it needs to be 6,500 for bias light. Nope. You got to set it to 7,000 for it to actually output yeah. 65. You know, there's so many, no, I've, I've, the Kino flows are pretty accurate. Ari's are pretty accurate in terms of the white balance, like where you put it, they're yeah. less accurate than. As long, as long as they're, as long as they're relatively new. I mean, they, they start to get a bit of a magenta spike in them, you know, with their, their hours or get, get high. And say with Kino get a bit green sometimes, like if they the get. Kino LEDs. LEDs. Yes. That's what. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I got to get out of the vernacular of calling them Kinos. <laughs> well, but the old Kino, the, the first generation of uh, Kino LEDs were were really green or really magenta. Like I remember the the, the new, the first, the gen, like uh, when I say it's the Celeb or something like that, but um, huh. the, yeah, they were they were great. But again, the, the, the LEDs, everything's come such a far, such a long way in terms of technology and and quality of light out of small sources. It's, it's pretty crazy. In uh, in what ways has, has the led, the modern good leds like helped and, and maybe kind of hurt the work you do? Cause I know that there's a lot of people who still prefer just like, you know, the good, the good old standard tungsten or H mic, cause you know what it looks like. It's punchy as fuck. You know, you can do what you need, but I, I used to think that way when I was like being a nerd and then I was like, you know what? Like, yeah, LEDs are sick unless you need a shit ton of power. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, it, it, it the, the LEDs don't throw, so you, they, you, you don't get a lot, you know, a sky panel from 15 feet and gets you like in a four stop, like with no diffusion on it. So once you start diffusing it and everything, you know, you start shaping it a bit all of a sudden, or if you bounce it now, all of a sudden you're dealing with like less than a two stop and it's right. not like they don't punch or throw the same as a, as a for now. And I, I, I used to be. A DP that I worked with a lot, Phil Lindsay, he used to do Lico bounces everywhere. And he would mm -hmm. just have, we'd have like a sea of Lico's in one corner and then bounces on like all the way through the set. Just, and all these Lico's were like hitting all these other sources. And it was, it was an interesting technique, but I. Inexpensive too. Oh, totally. Yeah. You could, we had, we had two buckets. Like I think we had like 24 of them and they just all up everywhere. It was crazy. Um, and I love when he did that because it was always, you can shape them. Like if you, if you just trim the, trim the size of the bounce, it would, it would diminish the light. So rather than, it, it was cool. Rather oh than, yeah. Huh? So rather than scrimming or d dimming, you could just trim, you could just trim the size of the source. It was, it was the little mat. Yeah. And he made Randy this, the, the key grip, like he had probably a hundred styro bounces and all shapes and sizes with like. Some of them with gold, some of them with silver, some of them, you know, plain, plain white. And it was, it was great. It was, it was a lot of work, but we, it was, I thought it was really effective and it looked great. It looked really cool. Had um, you, sorry. Uh, well, we were uh, getting, uh, after, we were getting off the topic of LEDs. Oh yeah. Sorry. Continue. So I think LEDs, the good thing about it is you can stick lights in, in places you couldn't before, like before, in order to get a single tube, you know, under a counter or under a bar you'd have to like run cables and power and all this stuff. And, and then you'd have to gel it or scrim it, or there's no dimming capability. So now you're able to put lights in places that were just like cars or, or, you know, any kind of, uh, again, bar set or kitchen, uh, cu cupboards and you know, drawers, whatever y you can basically get lights anywhere now. And, and the fact that they're battery powered, that they're iPad controlled, that they're it's just, it's just, it's just insane. Um, the, what you can do now without having to hide cables and, and gel lights and, you know, do all this other stuff. So I think that's, that's come miles, but that being said, <laughs> I mean, a season three of Kung Fu, man, like 
I lit that whole show with parkans and and T twelves. I mean, but oh, and blondes. I did I did soft boxes like big soft boxes with blondes. That's cool. And it was partly budgetary, but it was also. I just like, I love what a T12 looks like blasted through a window. Like it just, it's just something that you just can't like a nice big Fresnel, you know, pushing through it. Same with Hellstrom. Like we had, we had 6K Fresnels outside a lot of those windows and they just looked just something about that big Fresnel. It's just the quality and the push and how the, how the light pushes through the window. It, it's totally different to completely, it, it's you know, apples and oranges. I, I do have a weird half cocked theory about like, when people are like, oh, how do I make something look cinematic? I'm like, you actually just need more powerful lights. Like, you know, like yeah. because of LEDs or just like the ease at which you can bounce any, I'm using bouncing a single light bulb into my face, you know. Um, doesn't look that great, actually. Now that I'm, anyway, uh, point being, um, I think with how uh, uh, sensitive cameras are, you you can get away with with lower contrast ratios and just a lower base exposure and have, still have it look good, but it doesn't look good. Yes, yeah, I agree with you there. They, they, you, you really do need you, like my the the people that I that I like to emulate. Um, I'd say I'd put David Mullen up there, uh, like the um, marvelous Marcel. It was like, that was such a good looking series. Yeah. Um, but Ms. I mean, Basil. Ms. Basil, sorry. Um, uh, Darius Kanji for me, like, was just like I hold him at top. Like Delicatessen and City of the Lost Children were just, I mean, paint literally painting with light. And that when you watch people like that, like Bruno Debanel, like just guys that like understand color theory and 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 just again painting with light and just 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 those highlights, the low lights, understanding where to put the values and 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 how to tell the story by forcing a look, which is, is, is kind of, that's, that's, it's unnatural. Like it's, it's cause a lot of guys now are taking more light away than they are forcing a look. Of course. Yeah. I think, I think maybe that's the feature thing because you don't have time for that in TV. I don't think like, Oh really? Oh, cause you'd have to black out like entire sides of rooms and stuff. I, I, it's, it's, I, 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 and even budgetary wise, like budgets on TV are, well, the budgets on my TV are getting smaller. I mean, I think they're, you know, the SVODs, you know, coming in with giant budgets are, um, I don't know if those, it's, it's interesting. The industry is in such, such flux right now. We'll see what, what comes out the other side. Cause it's just, uh, by SVOD, do you mean like mini series? No, I mean like, uh, like the stranger things, like uh, this says, um, stream, right, uh, yeah. streaming video on demand. That's kind of gotcha. like the SVOD. So that's why I, I tell my agent, that's what we want next. Cause that seems to be the million dollar a day budget kind of right. project. Netflix but, has the money. Well, they do. Maybe, they, maybe. Well, that's again, we, I don't know if their business model is, is sustainable, right? Cause the, right. so many advertising dollars and, uh, it's, it's interesting how it all works. I'm definitely, uh, whenever people talk about Netflix as a business, I'm like, I don't know how they could, because they're always trying to get more subscribers. And I'm like, you have all of them. You, what, you are saturated. I don't know, like, if there is anyone else on the planet to subscribe. Right. But I mean, the, the, the cool thing is, is that they're able to do things that, because they, they know our personal information and they know how many people are going to watch, like, say, a Gilmore Girls or something like that. And I think right. that the, the cool thing about Netflix is that they are picking up shows and they're doing shows with, with, with specific demographics that could be sold certain, you know, certain things. So you have this like this perfect mashup of of they know the demographic that's going to watch, you know, Stranger Things, and and those people are apt to be you know buy or be sold certain products. And and I think that's it. That's where the future I think is going in terms of just like being able to. Um, just just like hone in on an audience and what what their likes are and just be able to cater to that audience how small or however big it may be i think if you if you can hone in and cater to that audience i think that's that's the big ticket and i, I think yeah. that same with the same with disney i mean all the mandalorian series and all that kind of stuff um loki they're totally catering to 
to that market. Like that's exactly what they're 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 giving them what what they want. And it's it's when you get shows that kind of stream away from you know whatever canon um, uh, source material may be. That's when people start turning their TZ, TVs off. Is because they're there to watch the comic. They're they're there to see the progression of this this character that they already know. I. Now, weirdly enough, I had kind of the opposite impression. Oh, well, not I shouldn't say impression of the business side. I think people are seem to be more interested in, I suppose it is canon, because I was going to say Mandalorian's not necessarily like a main character. Loki's not a main character. Mm-hmm. Um, and or, yeah. Uh, yeah, not main characters. And people seem to like those more grounded. Thing. And I mean, literally on the ground, like Andor was on the ground. It was never in space. <laughs> I mean, whatever. But yeah. yeah, I think people are, I think there's like a general tendency on the audience side towards what I will call quote unquote normal shows, even if they're sci-fi, even if they're fantasy, whatever, like just normal, like people doing things versus these huge ass tentpole superhero, um, you know, kind of rote films that all kind of tend to be structurally similar. Mm. Yeah. But again, I, I, but it, and the funny thing is, is it all comes back to just good story, <laughs> right? Which is, which is hilarious. But not it's not hilarious, it, but it is it is what you know what we kind of go in intending, hoping that we we get out of any project that we want to do is is that you're the end of the day you're going to tell a story that resonates and that um, that people can relate to, right? Like that, like people you you want to be on that 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 show where people kind of you know once the credits roll you're just like they want more or they 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 quest they're questioning everything like how could what, what did i just experience or whatever it may be right like that's that's kind of uh that's the end goal i guess yeah i mean it's certainly uh oh no i won't i was, I was gonna name a show and be like well if you were on the, I, don't, I don't need to do that uh there's a lot of good television out right now though it's it's hilarious how that used to be like such a you know oh you work in tv now and now it's like it's all connected it's all visual media. I think. I think that's again the 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 the, the money and the and the the quality of the, the the cameras and lenses and everything else. Like your your ability to do more with less is is um is just grown exponentially. And I and I think that you know feature film what were you know what we used to be feature film DPs and actors are now are now taking on web series and not web series but like um, you know straight to straight to video. Um, TV and movies that uh, I, I just again it just wasn't available before, and and I think that that really makes it. Um, it's just everybody stepped their game up. So now when you go see a movie, you're just kind of you're you're not you you really, I mean, you you're watching Hollywood, like, you know, high budget Hollywood grade TV. So that when you see a movie, that the impact I think it, it's great to see things on big screens. Like I, I love the theater, but I mean, right now I'm rewatching. I just got in, you know, like a 65 inch OLED, and I'm rewatching a whole bunch of stuff um, on that just because it's the, the resolution is amazing. I just want to see how older projects held up, and it's pretty crazy, like how uh, television has kind of eclipsed the movies in terms of look and uh, yeah. and a story and just a bunch of it's just a whole bunch of things. I, 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 I am, again, I'm really interested to see where the future goes because it's really, we're at this point where, um, yeah, people are people again with the, the, the pandemic, people are staying home more. They're not, they're still, I don't think they're still going to the theaters, which is, which is a shame. Cause I mean, I, that, that experience as a kid is what, what, what made me want to get into the movie industry was just walking into a, you know, um, just a movie and just and walking out and just not just flabbergasted. Like, what did I just, what just happened there? Like, I have to go see that again and again and again. And I, I'm not sure that that, well, maybe it exists. Like it does. Like there's, a, there's a few things recently that, that kind of blown my socks off, but. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's, I've seen it kind of as a good and a bad, like we, we and my friends just went and saw cocaine bear. So <laughs> this is a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. If you if you if you start with your if you start that's where your the beginning is. I'm sure it only gets better. Yeah, it's uh, Liz Banks did a good job. Um, awesome. But uh, especially if you like like 80s horror films, it's 
Um, but I was sitting next to my friend and she was, and I had noticed, this is the annoying part about going to movies with me. I had noticed that the center channel was blown. So it sounded like it was the dialogue and only the dialogue was coming through like, <clears throat> like a tin can. And so I'm like, ugh, I'm like twitching. And my friend's like, well, just go tell the people. I'm like, I'm not going to go tell the people like, what if they stop it? What if, what if I cancel this screening? So I just dealt with it and it was hard to hear. And I was really upset that, cause everyone was always like, movies are too hard to hear. They're too dark. Um, but the thing was, is she was like, do you go to movies for like the good picture or whatever? Quote unquote? And I was like, well, yeah, but I mean, there's other things. She goes, I go for the snacks. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, oh man. But that's I, like, how my girlfriend goes to hockey games. She's like, I'm here for the beer and the, the excitement and the fighting. And I'm like, right. yeah, all right. You know, I find the, um, it's really, oh man. I find it's hard to turn off my DP, my DP brain. Like I can't go in and, and just shut the lighting and camera off, especially on a big screen. Like there's things that I would never do, you know, on a, on a big screen that I, that I, I pull out on a, on a small screen, but I usually try and I don't, I don't, I don't watch too much TV. I mean, that's, that's changed over the last few years, but I really strived for wanting to do big movies. That was my end game, but um, so I, I would never really do close ups or or what I would consider a close up on a seventy foot screen, you know, versus sure. versus a forty inch screen. Um, so I, I I try I would always try to imagine my my projects going to the to the big screen so that um, both for lighting and for framing, yeah. um, so that I would never. You know, I would never do extreme close ups and, and even a close up again, like I'd, I'd want to see like kind of top, top button and I would never go inside unless it was, you know, story driven. So, um, but, 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 but seeing something on a big screen is, is just different. This is something, even if it's not exposed properly, you're like, again, like it's that two, two out of three, right? Like you can, you can have a good story with good acting. And I'll forgive the bad camera work and bad lighting or whatever, or you can have good lighting and, and a, a good story and I'll forgive the bad acting or you, you, I mean, it's just, so there's always that, that combination of, of, you know, good acting and great, great lighting. I'll forgive the big story holes as long as there's right. two, two out of the three will hold my attention. Right. But yeah. you can't have one out of three and, and three out of three is rare. I don't think you'll get three out of three very often in your lifetime. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is frustrating. I, <clears throat> I mean, people are just making so much stuff. What was yeah. I going to say about the, th oh, the thing about the theater that I've noticed is maybe the upshot. So the downshot is that people are just going to the theater t for snacks and they're not really engaged in film. And, it, and I don't mean like in suitable, but, he, but all of that, a lot of times that is the case. Um, but the good part is the people who are going to the theater tend to be moving people. Cause the people who don't really like movies are only going once a month, once every two months. But like the close, the, the theater I go to is the one at the century city mall here in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, uh, it's a very nice mall. It's the bougiest fucking mall I've ever seen in my life. Um, it's in, it's insane how like over polished that place is. Uh, but they have a really nice AMC there. And, um, a lot of times those, every time I've gone, like the place is full and then no one's talking, no one's on their phone. All the receipts are really nice. Nothing's broken. You know, and so when I hear people online complaining about, it, I'm like, fuck, that's right. You live in the Midwest where like, you're still dealing with <laughs> a projector that's gone out halfway. Well, that's, uh, I mean, it's funny. Cause like, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of the nineties in the Cayman islands in a kitchen. So I was working in the Caribbean and, uh, the that's movie cool. Actually, it was a lot of fun. I, I, I know most of my twenties were, were spent down there, which is, is again, I have no group, no regrets. <laughs> um, but the, um, the movie theater down there, no disrespect to anybody in Cayman Islands because I love them all, but um, they, uh, they use it as free um, air conditioning yeah. Yeah. in a way. And it's more of a social event. Like it's really, people aren't there to watch the movie. They're there to, to socialize, to throw popcorn at their, at their friends, you know, five, five rows ahead to, you know, just catch up on, on life and free air conditioning. So I didn't go to a lot of movies. Um, yeah. And when I was in, when I was living there, which 
it's funny because like I, I was so driven to get in the movie industry when I left there. Um, but what, what the benefit of that was is that when I came back into to you know the big city, I'm like I had so much to catch up on because I'd missed the Coen Brothers. You know, um, uh, oh, fascinating! <laughs> it was like you were in prison. <laughs> no, but I didn't know. I had no idea. Like I hadn't right, seen, right. I hadn't seen any advertisements for these movies. I hadn't seen any. I had no idea what these films were. So I came back and like Tarantino, the Coen Brothers, like, um, uh, man, I, I can't even. Did you get the Matrix? Like that? Train, train spotting. Well, as a Matrix. So I, I moved back right when the Matrix. That was the first movie I saw. Oh when I, shit! When I moved back to Canada, yeah, you know, it was just crazy, and that just blew me away. Right, like you that. You walk out of the first Matrix, and if, if you're not just like, "What the heck is this?" Like, you something's wrong with you. Like, you just experienced something that just it was so forward thinking. So, quick caveat: that was the other thing I was going to add to going to theaters and movie watchers. I went to the 20th anniversary screening of the first Matrix, and it's the first time. Granted, it's everyone who went intended to see that film, right? So it's not like I'm sure there's people who saw it for the first time, but. Um, when we left, everyone hung out in the lobby and was chatting about the film for like an hour. And that never happens on any other movie anymore. Even Top Gun, people are like, that was amazing. You want to go get dinner? You know? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and again, because that's the good, yeah, right. You already got something in common. But, but and, and, and again, it's one, but it's one of those films that you just come out like just completely like just, just living life. I mean, you're just like, yeah. it's just, yeah, I don't think it ever really loses its, uh, its luster at all, which is like really cool. But yeah. So like when I came back, like just everything, Guy Ritchie. So like, I mean, I was watching like, I, I mean, it was like, I think I, went to see, I, w I think I went to see Fight Club in the, in the theater, like, like 12 times because I was just like, I was just, again, it was just, a, it was just everything resonated. So I think that was really helped in terms of like the, the timing of, of just not completely being disassociated with media and movies altogether for, you know, six years to just all of a sudden being, you know, thrown into a, just a, a really great time in filmmaking. Um, and then trying to, and then having to catch up with like another, you know, half decade of, of films. It's fantastic. So I just, I, yeah, I was really happy that that was my, my go-to. That, that must have been a, a rather sizable kick in the ass <laughs> to come back to that. Because I've said on this podcast a lot, like that late '90s filmmaking era was early 2000s to a degree was very similar to like the golden era, of, not golden, not the literal golden era, but like what I consider the the '70s, you know, kind of more director focused yeah. films. Um, yeah, but I will say, in the time that you were coming up, uh, music videos were a great way for people to get into the industry, and now it's kind of like all music videos are you know, hired by the artist and they have a thousand dollars, you know, there's not like, like David Fincher would not be jumping off of YouTube into, well, maybe he would, but like, you know what I mean? There, there's your, your Mark Romanex don't tend to pop out of music videos that often anymore. Um, but I was wondering for you, like what that experience is like working in the music video space, but also like, what did you learn from those sets? Cause those tended to be like the most creative from my point of view. Well, and, and that's where, again, I, I mean, it was, uh, that I learned so much and, and, and you can, the cool thing about music videos is that you can push to, you know, 140% and, and mistakes, mistakes aren't mistakes. I mean, if you make a mistake, you rack focus all the way out of, you know, you go all the way out and come back again and it's, it becomes art, right? Which I, I think, um, you need to embrace that. And then, and you don't really, you know, it's all about camera movement. It's all about crazy force lighting. It's all about flares and pushing pushing the camera to its absolute limit so that when you come back to TV or more movies, you know, the limit of the cameras, you know, the limit of the lighting, you know, where to put the light to get that flare you want. And, and, and it becomes a, it, I think it really helps you, um, just in terms of all around understanding the, the, because again, like any, I can take any camera and make it look good as long as you stay inside of its happy, you know, uh, happy space, but it's understanding where it's happy space is. And then by, by pushing, into its unhappy space that you understand. Does that make sense? Like it's yeah. Like it's I, so you're, so music videos. I started as a gaffer. I was doing like like Nickelback and a bunch of country videos, and I had, I had a lot of fun. Like I mean, but then 
a couple of the the directors that I was you know working with as a gaffer, DPs weren't available. Um, you know, this 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 or that would happen, or or they would recommend me because I was I was gaffing and they were out of town or whatever maybe. And and um, yeah, that was my first step. Like when I when I when I stepped away from lighting for good, where I finally said, okay, this is it. I'm not not going back as a lighting technician for you know for any time in the foreseeable future. I think music videos and commercials kind of kept my it just kept me going until I actually started getting solid work on my own, which is, and again, because it led, because it led to just so much, um, experimentation, it was kind of, again, it's like a film school on its own where, it, cause I, I don't take any project I do and just settle for what it is. I always try to push it, stick it on a shelf that doesn't exist yet. Right. It's just, a, it's just, I just think that that's my job is to take you know, take the ordinary and, and, and try and push the limits, but, but knowing the limits, I think, you know, you need to learn that over time or, yeah. you know, in a camera bay, figuring things out before you get, you know, a bunch of eyes looking at you, um, expect with high expectations. <laughs> dude, it, the number of times I've heard like colleagues of mine be like, dude, uh, it was the first time I, I was able to use in this case, like a Raptor. I thought it was going to be like any other camera. It wasn't. Now I'm getting confused. You know, I'd replace Raptor with whatever, but it's I'm like, bro, you could go to the rental house. They're like, they'll let you play with cameras. Pro tip for anyone listening. You can just go to a rental house and play with cameras. They don't care. They, they actually get excited about it. If you're, if you're wanting to learn in a lot of places, like if, at the right places. We'll get yeah. Excited. I mean, nice ones. Yeah. The ones in LA tend to be very cool about that. Yeah, no, same with, same with Vancouver. I and mean, they're very, very open to... You know, they, again, if you're if you're curious and you're interested, they they're they're more than willing to help facilitate for sure. Yeah. The uh, I wanted to know if you had kind of a, you know, not thinking too hard about it, sort of a generalized thought on the difference between the lighting on, say, your Mission Impossible. I was gonna say Twilight, but that man, <laughs> there's like no light on that film. Um, <laughs> you're like your Mission Impossible. Uh, versus kind of your more indie features or even your web series or something like that? Like anything that you kind of immediately notice? Well, again, I mean, I, so I was, I was a, both, I did second unit and rigging on on Mission Impossible Ghost, Ghost Protocol and just the scale and the size of the rigs that were there, like both in terms of grip electric, like they had, they had, so the the, the parking garage scene with the, the paddles that took the parking, uh, uh, they, they had, um, six stories of it built. Um, there was a full ring of lights that were just like, I mean, it's just, it's a, we were in a place that was the size of a football stadium. It was an enclosed, like they, they, it was, it was to, they'd make, um, ferries like passenger ferries in there and, or, or, or service the ferries in there. So they, they oh, cool. They basically turned it into the stage, but there was, there was, I think a dozen, um, like 30 by 20 um, soft boxes with like like 12 Dino lights in each one of them, and and so the they and they would they would lower on chain motors and then you could valve and, and valve them and so the gaffer was just like okay turn on box six seven eight nine ten eleven and you just have this like, it was insanity and then again the the lights that were built into the set and all the other things I mean I mean I think the 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 stunt where Tom Cruise jumps off the rafters and onto the car. There was six techno cranes, and it was all film. They would they'd shoot all 60, right. 65 mil or Vista Vision, and all off speed. And it was like like six techno cranes. I think there was like nine cameras shooting at the same time. It's just so crazy. And so the the scope and the scale of both. Oh, and then they had two green screens that would be able to like hover. So on an iPad, it's the first time I saw an iPad used. Where the iPad, so you could you could pull in these thirty by thirty green screens, drop them, hinge them, and spin them. So they then they they traver, they traverse the whole stage, like so you could you wow. could greens in and then spin them and then 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 valve them to wherever you need it. It was it was again, I was just floored, dropped like as so you could just put it behind whatever action you wherever you put the camera, you could just drop a green screen behind it, hundred percent. And it was just like seeing something on a scale like that. Just I'd never seen that before. It was just it just. It just floored me. And it's the same with like I, I did a commercial with uh, Claudio Miranda, um, oh, like on the commercial. <laughs> oh, dude, he was a like another guy. Like I just 
just so technical and so on point. Like he had the like this was like that's that put this at like 2015. He had the whole commercial like it was a oneer that wrapped around the car. The car never moved, but it made it look like the car was moving the way the commercial was shot. Hmm. Um, so it was a single steady cam oneer that started and, and moved around. But he had the whole thing. Um, already specced out on his laptop, like within a three dimensional world. I don't know what, I don't even know what program he was using, but he's like, he was, he was saying he wanted 150 Mac two, cause at the time it was before LEDs. So he wanted Mac, those moving lights, the Mac 2K moving lights so that he could have instant on off. And then, uh, oh, like the, the concert lights. That's right. So he wanted 150 in these two soft boxes that went the whole side of the stage. Oh. Production could only afford like 75 of them or something like that. And he's like, no, no, you don't understand. And he, he took his laptop, flipped it open, hit the space bar. He's like, this, this is why I need 150 in each box. And, and it was already lit. Like the whole thing was already composed, done with lighting. Like it all had, like, and, and it was like, it's like 2015. I was just like, what? What? <laughs> what is this here? Like, it's just so beyond, you know, like, like I've never seen anything like that before. And so that just opened up another, you know, portal to my brain that just says like, okay, this, okay, I got to step this up. Like this is like, this dude's like, he is on point. And, and, and he brought his, um, his lamp, uh, his board operator from LA with him and he'd follow him around. He had like a little wheelie cart and he'd follow him around with a, like a hog board. And he'd be like, da, 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 da. And this, Claudio was just like, da, 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 da. it was like, it was, it was great again. Just fly on the wall, sit down and watch it happen. And, and it's just really cool. Yeah. I mean, that's why, first of all, thank God we got the little, uh, the Wi-Fi uh, DMX now. So now that guy can just have an iPad. He doesn't have to break his back. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. I can, anyways, we, we, yeah, we can talk about it another time. But yeah, that, I I think he was trying to get him out on another fun feature that they did in Vancouver. Um, can't remember the name of it right now, but yeah, that, I can understand why. Like he would just, he would literally just follow and, and, and just, just constantly programming. It was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and the reason I ask about like the bigger stuff is exactly like you said, like, I think, um, like I'm, I'm humble is not the right word, but I'm, I'm, you know, self-aware enough to know that I don't, I don't know how to light something like that. And in my head, I just would go, Oh, it's like the small one, but bigger, but like small one for me is like, you know, eight by bunch of light off to the side, neg over here, a little backlight. Can I just do that bigger? But I would never think to, you know, use concert lights in a softbox to mimic, you know, street lamps going by or anything like that. Cause that's such an efficient way to do it too. Using, cause no one's going to use concert lights, but I guess no. they do. Well, again, if you, at the time, if you needed like straight on, on, on off with no dimming capabilities, that's, that was the light, man. Like if you needed color shift with no, like not seeing the color shift. I mean, that was, it's the right choice. And, and it, it's, it's, uh, it was at the time, it was a huge, like the other commercial I did with him, I did a, a Hyundai commercial with him and he did, we, it was just after he did Tron and they, they, so they brought in, I think we had every eight foot Kino flow in North America shipped to, shipped to the stages. And we built these like V's that, that the car would drive through, that the car would drive right through the middle. And again, it was just like, just watching him work was just it, it's just pretty cool like it is and again when you see that when you see that next level between indie and big s scale it it um it does it opens up another side of your brain that you're like oh okay that like it, it's not that hard it's still three-point lighting right. but now, but now it's you know i'm dealing with a football field instead of a 20 by 20 room and right. it, so you're it's just it's just yeah it's pretty cool and asking for a million dollar lighting packages, like <laughs> what I can do that. But again, that's, that's half of the job is looking, is like reading the room, right? Like if you have the budget and you have the people and they're giving you the time and the resources and their expectations are like to the moon and, but they're giving you the time and the money to do the, those things, then obviously utilize it. But on Indies, you don't have that time. You don't have that money. And, and so you kind of utilize your, you know, okay, your key grip is is like top notch but your dolly grip he was just like oh hey look cool this thing goes up and down so you're like okay so i can't do crazy doll <laughs> but my lighting guys are like on point right so i can you know so you, you take everything or my my 
my set deck guys are like right there for me. So, okay, let's focus on setting stuff in the foreground and making it. So you, you kind of utilize your pluses and you take your minuses and still work with them. But, but just understanding where your, where your low, you know, the low end is, and then kind of utilizing the high end. And then again, it it's, I don't think it changes as the budgets get bigger. It's just you, you, as the budgets get bigger, there's no excuses as to why you can't do things because they'll just throw more more money at it, right? So you that's that's where having that technical side, I think, helps. Yeah, I have the best transition. How how, uh, how have you applied the the uh, music video kind of punk rock knowledge with the large knowledge the uh, large set knowledge to make kung uh, kung fu? So Season kung three Season advertisement. Three. There he is. <laughs> Did it. it? Was pretty good. Um, and it, I, I might have a lot of fantasy stuff on that show, right? I don't think people when they when they hear kung fu, I don't think they're expecting fantasy. I don't think they're expecting you know mysticism and stuff like that. So I totally they let me go full music video, which for a network CW show, I was I'm both I'm both humbled by it and appreciative that you know um uh, bob burns and uh, christina cam the the the, the producer they're the uh, the um the writers and uh, creators of the show i would so i did a whole sh- i did a whole sequence in um uh infrared so oh. they, so they 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 wrote it as a black void and it was about it, it was about half the show and and it wasn't, you know, it was partially my, you know, the Black Void had been overdone recently, you know, in Stranger Things and a few other shows, it, but that was It's always it. sunny. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, that wasn't, the, that wasn't what rubbed me the wrong way. It's just the story, in the story, it, it, it needed, it needed something. It needed to be like something vibrant. It needed to be something, you know, based in like grounded, but something I could do in camera that would you know, give us, give us an effect or a look that wasn't visual effects because they didn't have a huge visual effect budget on that show. So I I knew from Reese actually, like in Reese, I kind of turned off the green channel. I don't know if you noticed any of that, but I shut the green channel off completely. And I, I, so when I, as soon as I, were you able to do that in the red one, like actually turn off a channel? This was no, this was so that they did it in, we did it in, in, uh, Da Vinci. Oh, okay. Uh, I, when they rendered out Reese, it took them, I think, I think like 12 days to render it out because I kept breaking, I kept breaking the machine because it wasn't, it didn't. And like, this is when you had a resolved machine, not the free software that we know today. <laughs> and the, and the, 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 the camera, the, the machines were just catching up to 4k and it was, so to render out 4k with like heavy color correction and like a heavy LUT was, was, you know, unheard of. Right. Uh, anyway, so. So I took that and, and right away I went up to Richard Spate, who was the director on that, uh, the uh, infrared, um, uh, that was episode five, I think season two. So, and I, I'm like, Hey man, nice to meet you. I'm Chris. This scene doesn't belong here. <laughs> and right away he was like, you're right. Like this isn't, this isn't the thing. And, and John Bring, who was the, the, you know, the, re- the representative of the writing room was like, you know what? Like that was just kind of a placeholder. Like we just wrote it like that as a, as a, okay, well, this is, this is a, um, just to, just to fill the, this is an unknown kind of territory, right? Like right. And foreign to them. So right away, so Richard actually, uh, Rich Spade actually, um, suggested a theater, like doing it in like an abandoned theater with like overgrown, um, foliage and stuff like that. Then, then I'm like, okay, that's a guy of a cool, interesting idea. And, then, and I'm like, Hey, how about this? Cause I'd seen this documentary where they'd shot, actually shot infrared. And so I showed him some samples and I'm like, I wouldn't do like this per se, but I would turn off the green channel. So we'd shoot it in what would be a forest. I'd turn off the green channel and we'll shift that everything green to red. And then I had to do camera tests and I, I, so I pitched it, I had to do a pitch session and I do camera tests. I had to do a bunch of stuff, but right, everybody was like on board right away. And, and to me, I wasn't expecting that from network television. Like I, I, right. Is even Hellstrom like a, a lot of that stuff? I, that that was Bernard that had set that up already. But and even so, I, I walked in on season two of Kung Fu, and Lindsay had already Lindsay George had already set this really cool, moody, broody family dynamic show, which I'm like, this is awesome. Right. 
they started writing these worlds and voids and and realms and you know all the stuff from from my episodes which i was just like okay cool and i did i went full music video and i was i'm really proud of how that turned out just in terms of i couldn't i couldn't see it on the day so it was almost like shooting film again like because um so you were like, shooting with like an infrared red you were just doing that in post we looked into it, but I, I it, again, just talking with my DIT, uh, Jonathan Yip, and and what the capabilities were, and then there's only like four, what I learned was there's only like four areas that are actually tuned into infrared in the world, and they were they were all booked. So- They're all booked on Get Out. <laughs> probably. So then, so I'm like, okay, well then how do I do this? So I had to kind of do it blind. Like I had a lot that was, we sent to post, they sent it back to us as like a, a a file we uploaded it um into the camera but it really wasn't even close to the final product so we were completely shooting it blind and, and my hopes were that the colors weren't going to affect the costumes or that mostly the faces that was my biggest worry um it didn't for my tests at all but i i was i lost so much sleep on that episode mm -hmm. i i really i couldn't i couldn't see what i was delivering and then, and then post post-production totally like just killed it. Like, oh, Jordan Men, like the colorist on that show, so happy with all of the work that he did. Like, it's just, it was really, um, uh, yeah, Chris Boyer was the colorist. Sorry, Jordan Men was the post. But the, that everybody there was just like, like Chris Boyer, man. Like, by the time we got to the episode, like halfway through season three, I was, I was giving zero notes. Like, hey, can you knock that wall down a little bit? Like, that was, that was like, I mean, he had the, he had the show and he had me. He had me dialed by the time we got through it all. So anyway, so 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 season the season finale of um, season two, I was putting mirrors in the shot in the forest and like putting like I don't know if you uh, how much of it you've seen, but I was doing like because we were using G series Panavision glass. Very nice. I was, just, I was just pushing like eighteen k airy boxes into mirrors like in the deep background and then redirecting them right into the camera. And so that you get these like, just like pings of that, just smoking the heck out of the forest. Like it was, it was full music video, man. Like we were going and, and I was <laughs> losing my mind and I, I swear I'm surprised I lived through it. But you know, again, like Joe Menendez is the director. He's patient and he really like, he's like, okay, I see where you're going with this and this is gonna work. It's just, it takes time because as soon as you adjust a camera, I gotta go and adjust all those mirrors. So if we right. adjust an actor or adjust marks or whatever, because it has to hit at certain times and it's, it was, it was, ah, we just, <laughs> it was good. But, and again, I think this, this last season we did like that Thailand episode and then the, um, the kind of a haunted house, more of a haunted um, um, community center episode. And I thought those turned out really well too. So. Yeah. Uh, but I think knowing, knowing the cameras, knowing the lenses, understanding where I can push, I think that, that really, it, it's all, a, it's all a combined effort, I guess. Yeah. Also note, I meant nope, not get out, but cause they used it for it on it. Yeah. Nope. Was, anyway. That was, that, that's a great, that was actually just a crazy movie, man. That was pretty neat. They, they pulled off. I was just this, like, I, again, that's my style of stuff. Like just, yeah. So, that's uh i didn't want to stand on that but i'm glad you said that because that's exactly what i was going to get to you know especially coming into shows late being a second unit a lot of times um or even rigging or gaffing um you're around a lot of styles but maybe you're not honing your own style did you have you come to that yourself or do you think you're kind of amorphous in that regard is there like something that you're kind of gravitated towards uh look wise that really get you going or you think is like your shit yeah i mean i think again I, th I think what kept me what kept me going was the fact that i am a bit of a chameleon and i can give you your show without you know i don't have to do exactly i don't need a lighting plot to kind of give you the same book um um because i'm I, I have that technical background um a lot of the early shot a lot of the early stuff that i get as a dp was second units so, um and or insert units or whatever and they'd just be like okay go over there we're going to give you a quarter of the amount of people and a quarter of the amount of gear and the quarter of the amount of time, but we still want the main unit look out of it. You're just kind of like, holy smokes. And if you can survive through that, I mean, I think you can, you know, eventually surpass it. And, but knowing how to match looks, knowing how to, 
I mean, that, that kept me working, which was great. Um, and again, I think, I think Kung Fu, what I loved about it again, and I think it was all because of the creators and the network. Um, they didn't expect me to match the show per se. Like I put my own feather in it and it was very, um, it was very me. Like it wasn't, I didn't really try. Like, I mean, I, of course I'm going to give them Kung Fu. Like that's kind right. of the, the show's already established and it, it is what it is. No, it's seven now. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Right. Cause you don't, you can't, you've got to be, it's, it is, it's a hard balance. Right. And you, you can't even, even season three, like I, I was pushing for a wider aspect ratio because we, we were, we were shooting two to one, um, uh, with the anamorphic lenses. But this, the cast was growing. Like all of a sudden we had these other storylines uh, story that were joining our main cast. And I'm like, I would have loved to have been able to have a wider aspect ratio to, to showcase that. But because they'd already shot two seasons of, um, you know, at, at the two to one aspect ratio, they weren't really interested. So I ended up getting some primo close focus lenses to uh. get the wider aspect, like to get the the 14 and a half and 17 and a half primo. Um, and then I got the whole close focus series so that we could, we could start like really wide in a corner and then kind of move the camera into it over and move it into a single and then to have that dramatic, you know, uh, act out push at the, at the end. And, and so they literally only got a 35 mil lens, like right up against the person's nose and it's all still sharp. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, but the, again, it's like, it's, it is, it's hard to, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I've been able to kind of really push. Like that's why like right now I'm looking for like an indie feature so that I can really like that, you know, that I did Dead Shack with Peter Reek and that was a lot of fun, but, but it was again, budget and time constraints and all the rest of it. And just the, you know, out in, out in the woods in the middle of the night. Um, but I thought that, I thought that show ended up being okay for all the things that we were given, all the obstacles in our path. I'd love to, I'd love to get something from ground zero and build it up. Cause that's, I think a lot of, a lot of the stuff that I've done, um, in bigger, in bigger things have been, I've, I was doing second units. So they hired like, uh, that was Hellstrom. I was doing these giant second units and by episode five, um, by episode four, um, I think they'd realized that they needed an alternating DP and I, mm. I'd done all these crazy second units for them. And they just kind of looked over and they're like, Hey, you're pretty good at doing this. Like, why don't you, you want to, you want to hop on and, and do alternating episodes. And again, it was just like Bernard, Bernard was great. I, <laughs> he's just such a, he's another just amazing painter with light and just, a, he's done some giant, giant projects that I just admire a lot. So, um, it was, it was always, always a challenge, but I, I, I would love to dig my teeth into my own, like start from scratch, start from zero. Um, totally. uh, me, TV, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm on the fence right now. <laughs> I love TV, but I'm, I just wrapped, uh, whatever, 15 months of, of network television. So I'm a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking for. Uh, Stretch your legs a little bit. Yeah. Just get those, get those, uh, those feelers out. Maybe see if I can pull out and pull a movie out of my, um, uh, out of my repertoire. Totally. The, uh, I was wondering, cause I, I did second unit on a feature, um, last year and, uh, hadn't before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, I didn't understand just how little you can be given <laughs> to do to like, in my case, shoot the complete reverse of a scene. Uh, and then I was doing a bunch of like inserts. And then at one point I got to shoot a, an entire separate scene myself, which was cool. But, um. Yeah, shooting like the reverse of a scene with not. I got a tube, a tube. I got a Titan tube, and I was like, I own lights. I could have brought some. <laughs> like, and a lot of times you'll have the you'll have the main you know, one of the main producers as your director, and then they're going, hey, well, why doesn't this look like what we did, you know, on the other side? And and so you have to answer to that. And and so it, 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 luckily, did you you make it through? Obviously, yeah. And luck, I saw the film in a theater, and not only is there a lot of my footage in that movie, but it does look, it matches completely. So I didn't fuck up, but I was, oh, that, I was, that's, that speaks volumes, man. You did, yeah, like, I mean, I don't think, I don't think a lot of people really understand what that takes. I was sweating bullets, but, uh, being on this side of it, I was wondering if you had any advice for people like me, uh, and me basically about kind of making those things look with limited gear in your experience, making them match the better thing. I was, I just went light meter, color meter. And not half of it was outside. So it was like, eh. but 
Well, I, I, again, I think I think a lot of the times, like the the, the the first thing I do is is, I mean, you don't. And again, you don't get scouting or you don't get you know uh, prep meetings or anything for those second units either. But we're looking at what the location's already doing. I think a lot of the times will will help. And if you can if you can talk to the director and and really get the the angles of of, of you know try to showcase what the what's already naturally happening, I think that's going to help you. And I think taking away light right now, especially. These days, like if you shaping light and taking light away, especially because on those big second units and stuff, like they're not giving you time, they're not giving you equipment, they're not giving you gear. They just want. And again, the cool thing is that you know that everything's going to make it into the film because they have a yeah, it has to. <laughs> it has to no, they have a they have a slug that they have to fill. So, and that's what I actually liked about second unit was that is usually big stunts, big you know explosions, car chases, you know whatever it may be, but it's also. Um, it's boring inserts and stuff at times, but but you know that everything you shoot is going to make it into the movie. But so just, I think that you know for for people that are that are new that are trying to get that that leg in, just I think just be aware that you are going to get kind of bus chucked in a way, right? Like you're going to be given nothing, and that you're going to have to produce what main unit produced with all the toys and all the people and all the time, and that the best thing to do is to try to look at what you're given in terms of like your um your source material and and utilize the room in terms of like again i would i would take more light away than i would try and force it because you're not going to be given the condors and the 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 extra people and the whatever so just try and or or go you know again try and talk them into longer lenses and taking the you know just forcing the audience to look at the things that you need to to to, to showcase what they, they, to fill that slug and just understanding what that slug really needs. And that's, again, hopefully you have a, uh, I've been very fortunate in terms of working with um, great producers, but I, I, I have been like, I think, um, is it a movie called The Miracle Season? It was at the time called Live Like Line and really good story. Uh, Helen Hunt was, uh, and William Hurt. Um, oh, wow. You know, which is really cool. It's a you know, true, true story volleyball movie. Um, but I remember on day one, like the, 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 the producer who was directing looked at me and he's just like, why, like, what's going on here? Like, why isn't this working and blah, blah, blah. And, and I had to talk a second and I had to take a deep breath and I took the blame. I'm like, Hey, look, you know, like I'm just, I'm just rolling into this and, and this is, I, I'm sorry, it's taking a bit longer than we were expecting, but don't worry. It's, it's you know, give me, give me 20 minutes and we'll, we'll be up and running. But like, I, I tried to take it all on my own, like take it on my, on myself. And I think that. And I think that he respected that. I think he's like, I, I didn't throw the crew under the bus. I'm not like, hey, look, I'm not, you know, I didn't try to make excuses. I just kind of was like, look, you know, this is unfortunate, but it's going to take time. Give me 20 minutes and we'll, we'll be up and going. So it was, um, and then from then on, it was great. We had, I, I did the whole movie. Like we were always shooting like second unit, splinter unit, car driving scenes, like just a bunch of stuff. And again, it was a fun, it was fun. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, uh, I'm going to have to let you go because I've already taken up two of your hours, but <laughs> that's fine, man. That's good. Though. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for making the time. Of course. Well, thank you for making the time. But, uh, I end the podcast with the same two questions. Uh, and I've been interviewing a lot of TV people. So this first one doesn't quite make sense, but we're going with it. Uh, if, if you were to program a double feature with Kung Fu season mm -hmm. three, imagining it's one project, I guess. Uh, yeah. what would the other film or television be? Film or show? Mm -hmm. so if I was going to match something with season three, man, that would be hard. That's hard. I mean, I. Doesn't have to be the same. It can, no. it can be completely different. No, I know. I know. Let me think that. Like, that's a, that's a, I really should have, because I know that this questions were coming. And that's the thing. Oh, all right. I didn't prepare for this. Um. Man, I'm I'm trying to think because like like the show is like such a the show is such a grounded it's it's such a weird such a weird show in a way like it's so it's so grounded and it's so it's such a family drama with with great fighting and and but again there's that mysticism side that kind of does like it kind of throws you for a loop that I don't you know like so it's like trying to find something that would kind of marry that like what was that show what was the show. Uh, 
Oh, but I don't know that that would work either. There's that fighting. There was a the Wu uh, Wu Assassins like years ago. Um, oh, I don't know that one. Yeah, I don't. I'm because I, again, like, I think everything everywhere kind of has the fighting and the family and the mysticism. It does too, and, and I think everything everywhere would be kind of in the same. I, I mean, everything everywhere is is absurd, which I love. Right. Right, like it's it's absurdity for the sake of, but it but it's artistic absurdity. <laughs> yeah. So I think is amazing, and and it's just kind of like I I think you know what I I hate to I think everything everywhere because it it really has that it has that grounded family kind of and personal you know drama in terms of just like keeping it where it is. I I, I would I I think you're right. I think that's that's kind of it's it's not it's not as far fetched well but right but it is like it really because i mean if you bought if you've made it to season the end of season two of kung fu and you're going to start season three you have bought into this this crazy sci-fi mist you know mystic realm that that um you're you're in for the ride like by the time you get to season three and if if you don't you don't get into season three by by not being on board with the the sci-fi aspect so i i think i think i think that would be a good that would be a good pairing for sure there you go. Yeah, I, it's weird. It's funny because like CW shows are not necessarily made for quote unquote me, you know, <laughs> let's say, but they, they've they always had a, done a really good job of making stuff like, like I remember the first few seasons of Arrow, like being really involved in that. And that is a, that is a soap opera for kids. <laughs> and I was like as in college, like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do this. <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Um, yeah, CW makes some some good shows. It's cool to hear that they're letting you like kind of push the boundaries too. Because I, you know, I guess you got to compete with the old Netflix and stuff. So you might as well get weird. I think so. And 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 again, I think that it was it was in the writing and it was in it was in the trust that the creators gave me. I mean, I, I was really I was just again I was, I was kind of waiting for the letter saying, "Hey, thanks for coming out, kid. We really appreciated you and all your efforts." But uh, here's the door. You know, like at times because I really pushed. I pushed almost. I really pushed almost too far and, and they let me, which I think ended up in success personally. Totally. Uh, final question. Everyone asks about good advice. I want to know what the worst piece of advice you ever got was. <laughs> oh man. Worst piece of advice. I think you got me again. Like, I, I don't. This one's usually a big thinker. I'm going to start including it in the emails with it. <laughs> it is just to start to start going through it. I don't know that I've gotten a lot of advice as to you know per se. Like it's it's interesting how it works. Like, um, I think I mean, worst piece of advice. I I don't even know that it's advice. Like, but just, just know that everyone is, everybody wants to be a DP. So everyone's, everyone wants your job when you're looking around on set, almost everybody wants to be the director or everybody wants to be the DP and everyone is a DP you know, in their spare time. Right. And just, just don't, don't, don't assume that, that is all, um, yeah, if, if, usually if there is no, if no one's talking to you about the picture, then the pictures are probably pretty good. And I wish somebody gave me that advice. If they start talking, if they start talking to you about the picture, it's usually because they don't like what they're seeing. So right. like, I don't know, like, I guess that's good advice, but uh, that'll work. We'll take it. <laughs> okay. Sure. But, but it's just like, if, if there's no, if they're not talking to you about the picture, then you're pretty golden. But if, if, if they, if all of a sudden they start talking about the picture, it's usually not good stuff. So just, just, they're over your shoulder at the monitor. You're like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> no, the person, the person that kind of is, is spending a little bit more time, you know, uh, at the monitor, you kind of give them a side eye, but that's, that's about, that's about all I'm trying to think of that. I don't think I've really been given like an actual bad piece of advice, which I, I don't know if that's lucky or if that's, I mean, like, that happenstance. I've had a couple of people ask me and then I had to, I realized like, oh, I can't remember any advice because I never took it. Didn't matter if it was good or bad. I was just so like, and not that I thought I was amazing or anything, but I just always, I would take people's advice as like a generalized thought 
And then I'm, and then I'd be like, I'll see how that applies to my life. But first I'm going to throw my head first, you know, face first into this wall. And then, and then your advice to wear a helmet's going to, oh, I guess I should have, you know. Well, again, I, I, I don't think everyone has your best interest in, in mind and, and you really have to trust your own instincts, right? Like you really, it's a job where you have to, good or, good or bad, right or wrong, you have to trust your instincts to make a decision and forge forward with it. And, and everyone has to buy into your instincts enough that they're going to run off the cliff with you when you, when you, you know, go ahead and when you forge forward. So it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 that's all I got. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks uh, so much for, for chatting with me, man. That was a lot of fun. And when you finally get that uh, indie, we'll have you back on. We'll talk about that. Thank you. No, that would be great. I'm I, uh, looking forward to uh, to many more chats. And, and thanks. Yeah, well, this, was, this was great. Appreciate it. Awesome. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the F at R Mapbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>